today we will continue that discussion uh, with some of the respiratory infections causing the common cold. So when we talk about common cold, uh, coryza meaning um, meaning uh, you know having a red red nose, having some of that nasal discharge, clear nasal discharge. That's common of the common cold. Now. If the question stem is giving you a time of year, they are trying to give you the answer. Okay, so if uh, if you are given a question that does not specify the time of year, I would like you to choose adenovirus as the cause of the common cold. Okay, we know what the common cold looks like. Uh, seven days of, you know, um, of inflammation, um, you know, purulent discharge, uh, mu mucopurulent, so clear nasal discharge, congestion, a uh, low fever under 100.4, um, and so that's what we look for with the common cold. Uh, we've all had it before. We know what this looks like. So they don't give you the time of year. I'd like you to choose adenovirus. This is going to be our most common cause of the common cold. But if they're telling you that this happens in October. If it happens in October, I'd like you to choose the rhinovirus. Rhinovirus and coronavirus are kind of funny in that they come and go with the seasons. So in the summer and fall, we tend to see more rhinovirus infections. In the uh, winter and spring, we see more coronavirus in infections. Now, how am I going to remember that rhino is summer and fall, corona is winter and spring? Well, during the summer and sometimes in the fall, if you live in a warm place like Eva does, uh, you do not need to wear a jacket. You can go out with your arms naked, okay? And rhinovirus is a naked virus, so that's going to help us remember that. Versus our coronavirus, this is winter time, this is springtime, it's snowing. It's actually, I'm looking out the window right now, it's snowing here. Uh, if you go outside, you're going to need to be enveloped in a big furry coat. So coronavirus is our enveloped cause of the common cold, okay? Great, so that's how we're going to remember that. No vaccines. Uh, we're not really worried about uh, directly treating the symptoms, just kind of giving supportive care. We can't get reinfected with these because they have those uh, capsids that change quite a bit uh, while we are infected by them. And so we can see reinfection happening. Okay. One of the things that we do need to watch out for is a superimposed bacterial sinusitis. Bacterial infection of the sinuses can be quite painful and does require antibiotic relief. Okay, And so for bacterial sinusitis, we will need to uh, give antibiotics, bacterial otitis media. Again, we're going to want antibiotics. The most common cause of otitis media in adults is going to be our strep pneumo. Okay, So you're going to want to make sure that you give a uh, you give an antibiotic that covers strep pneumo because that's our most common cause. All right, influenza virus. Uh, this is a segmented, enveloped, negative stranded, uh, single stranded RNA. Now, uh, as we move through these viruses, I'd like you to take note whenever it says segmented, because this is something that gets asked about quite a bit, actually. So for our segmented viruses, we have influenza, obviously, it's right here. Uh, HIV is another segmented virus. Rotavirus is another segmented virus. And I believe there's one more that will come to me later. But for sure, influenza, HIV, rotavirus, um, <clears throat> these viruses, when they're inside of the capsid, so here's the envelope. Here's their capsid. Inside of here, we're going to have strips of, of DNA, okay? It's gonna be segmented. And this is important too, especially uh, in the context of influenza virus, because not all segments are the same. Uh, viruses go through changes in their DNA just as we do when we, um, you know, uh, procreate and create a new baby. So cute. We are going to be making changes in the DNA. Not only are they a mix of mom and dad, they're also going to have some new slight, slight changes in their DNA that weren't there before. Same thing for these influenza viruses. So we're going to have slight changes in these DNA. So here's uh, influenza um, A1. We'll call this guy A1. And here's going to be influenza virus a2, okay? Here's A2. And A2, if I can change color here just to improve the description. So A2 has this one slightly different type of DNA, and that's why we call it A2. And so 
what can happen is um, the, our A1 virus can infect a uh, potential host, right? It can infect a human, a bird, a pig. It can infect a host, and one of these individual viruses will infect a cell. We'll call this a respiratory cell. The virus will come, it will inject its DNA into this cell, okay? Now, another virus can also come and inject its DNA into this cell. And as we know, this particular virus has a little bit of a different DNA, okay? Now, when this uh, virus goes on to create its progeny, it may have bits of A1, bits of A2, it's going to be a whole new mix, okay? And then, so this reassortment, of viral DNA is going to allow for a lot of mutations, and it's what's going to allow for endemics, okay? So when we have an, uh, a pandemic, what's happening is we've had a new reassortment of DNA that's allowing for this virus to become more virulent, to infect a new species, to infect a new type of cell, um, and that is all due to viral reassortment, okay? I want this reassortment idea to be very comfortable in your minds. And please stop me if it's not making sense or if you'd like me to go over it again, because this reassortment is very important in understanding why pandemics occur, okay? Pandemics occur because we have this reassortment of DNA. How can we have reassortment? It is segmented. It's segmented. If two viruses infect the same cell, that DNA can get reassorted into the progeny, which now have the abilities of A1 with some of the new abilities of A2 um, all mixed together, okay? And so the reason that I gave them these names A1 and A2 is because actually the name that we, the way that we name these viruses, if you think about um, a certain pig flu that came about, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years back, we called it H1N1. Okay, because this is the way that we name these different viruses. And so the one is ref referring to the particular peplomer of the neuraminidase, and the N1 is referring to the particular hemagglutinin. Both of these peplomers are important for viral entry into cells. Viral entry into cells. And so if we get a new neuraminidase, if we get a new hemagglutinin, we're going to be able to enter a new type of cell. We're going to be able to uh, establish an, an infection uh, more quickly, etc. Okay, so how do we diagnose this? We have a rapid antigen detection. I really want to go back to my red color. This blue is making me nervous. So we have rapid antigen detection we can use to, to identify this, the rapid flu test. Um, clinically, we're looking for high fevers. That's really what's really gonna be common with flu. High fever and myalgia. Those two together are just our classic. You know, you always hear flu-like symptoms. They'll talk about, oh, you know, when your patient has um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, you're gonna see these B symptoms that look like flu-like symptoms. What is a flu-like symptom? Here it is right here. You get the fever, high fever. You get a myalgia, which is um, pain in your muscles, soreness. And then you're going to have the signs and symptoms of the common cold. So you can have sore throat, headache, uh, extreme physical weakness, clear nasal discharge is what we're looking for. Okay. If we catch this virus within 48 hours of illness onset, we can give an antiviral. Okay. If it's after that first 48 hours, there's not much we can do except for supportive care. Okay. That's an important thing to distinguish and something to look for in the question stem. You're not going to treat someone who's been sick for a week. Okay. Triple valent, quadrivalent vaccines. Um, did you guys get your flu shot already? I hope so. If not, go get it. it flu season has uh, is here. It is among us. Reassortment is among us. And neuraminidase peplomers is among us. So get that flu vaccine. Okay. Moving on to inflammation of the upper respiratory tract. Uh, here we are looking for varying degrees of respiratory distress with each of these. <clears throat> so here we have a bunch of, of bacteria and viral causes of upper respiratory tract infections. So our upper respiratory tract, that is all of the larynx, it's all of the voice box, this entire area up here, epiglottis, um, even into the bronchi, bronchioles is all considered upper respiratory tract. Beyond the bronchioles is really where we consider lower respiratory tract. Getting into our alveoli, getting into you know um, our, our you know, lobar pneumonia would be a lower respiratory tract. We're still upper respiratory tract at the, um, at the point of the bronchial, okay? So great. 
Let's talk about our Haemophilus influenzae. This is a bad, bad boy, right? This is why we vaccinate. This causes an inflammation of the epiglottis. The epiglottis, if this is our if this is our trachea, our wound tube, the epiglottis is this little piece of tissue that is going to come over and collapse on top of our trachea whenever we swallow food. It's a very important part of our swallowing mechanism because it prevents food from entering our windpipe. We don't want food in there. It doesn't feel good. So uh, this epiglottis is very important. If the epiglottis gets inflamed, now it's going to be covering the windpipe almost permanently. Not good, right? Um, our patient's not going to be able to breathe if their windpipe is covered, if their trachea is covered. So we'll talk a bit about the identification, gram-negative bacilli. Uh, transmission is via respiratory droplets. Look out for children with this one. The virulence factor, I'm going to put a big star here. This PRP capsule and the type B strain is what gives Haemophilus influenzae its virulence. If it does not have that PRP capsule, Haemophilus influenzae is not going to cause epiglottitis. It needs this PRP capsule to cause this manifestation. Okay, and so this is a very important virulence factor you will be asked about. Okay, diagnosing it is that classical chocolate agar. Uh, we can do a PRP capsular antigen test to see if this is the epiglottitis causing Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, and then we always learn about this thumb sign on lateral neck x-ray, which is basically just the epiglottis sticking out like a thumb right over our trachea. A bad, bad sign, right? Because we can end up with respiratory failure. Uh, clinically, this is really going to start kind of benign. We're going to see a kid, you know, it's typically going to be a child with sore throat, fever, malaise, doesn't want to go to school. You say, okay, you know, maybe you have a, uh, you know, a common cold, upper respiratory tract infection, you'll get over it. And then that kid starts drooling. If they give you a kid who has a fever, a sore throat, and is in your office drooling, that is epiglottitis and it is an emergency. Okay, so uh, getting that uh, kid, um, you know, respiratory help, you may need to intubate this child if the epiglottitis is severe enough. Uh, respiratory failure is imminent. Okay, watch out for this drooling. Very important epiglottitis, Haemophilus influenzae, and drooling. Okay, rapid progression to respiratory distress. If they're drooling in your office, that is an emergency. Okay. You'll also hear about this muffled voice, uh, painful swallowing. That's kind of common to some of these other ones, but that drooling is pretty specific. Also, this strider, high-pitched sound on inspiration. You can imagine wind coming, trying to get wind. Uh, air, you know, breath, trying to get past this swollen epiglottis into the trachea, um, you know, is going to make some noise, right? Kind of like our aortic stenosis as that blood tries to get through a stenotic valve. We have air trying to get through a very small space here, and it calls strider. High pitch sound on inspiration. How do we prevent this? We are going to give the Hib vaccine. Okay, Hib vaccine is going to be a bits of that capsule that will mount an immune response, so if that we get exposed to Haemophilus influenzae, it won't be deadly. Okay, now anyone who has had contact with this child anyone living at home, if the child spends a lot of time in daycare, even in the daycare, but the home is going to be the primary thing, all the caregivers at home are going to get rifampin. Okay. Rifampin chemoprophylaxis to eliminate carriage. Uh, a lot of times in adults, we can be colonized by Haemophilus influenzae, even the PRP capsule type, and not have symptoms. Okay, we have enough immune response. However, there's still some carriage there. So let's give that rifampin and eliminate anyone, eliminate any residual bacteria um, that, that people are carrying around with them. Okay. Moving on to pertussis. Pertussis, aka whooping cough, is caused by something called Bordetella pertussis. This is again a gram negative bacilli, easy to remember. Uh, respiratory droplets, and really this is going to be unvaccinated or people without boosters. We have a really nice um, uh, vaccine for this. It's called P uh, Tdap, and that is going to be tetanus, uh, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis. Uh, pertussis is such an active bacteria that we're actually not even going to give cells when we go when it comes to vaccines. We're going to give an acellular pertussis. We're going to cook down that bacteria into just its proteins and give that as the vaccine. 
Renin's factor is again very important here. So we have a filamentous hemagglutinin and protactin that help to add to uh, grab onto the cells. We have pertussis toxin, which causes adhesion and damage, increases the CAMP levels, resulting in edema. Ultimately, what we will have here is uh, a lot of inflammation in the uh, respiratory system, okay, which causes that whooping cough and a a prolonged course, okay? Pertussis, when you have an infection of pertussis, it has a typically a very long course, I'm talking like months, okay? Is how long your patients will stay infected. You may see some stimulation of pancreatic islet cells resulting in hypoglycemia, rare, very, very rare. This is, you know, we're going for 270s with something like this. This is rare, you would get a question on that, but it's there for your, for your um, you know, trivia purposes, I guess. We have this special agar called Bordet Gegnu agar, uh, also called also known as Reagan Low agar. We can do serology and PCR of our patient's blood to look for antigens. Okay. The phases of pertussis is important. So we're going to start out with a catarrhal phase of one to two weeks. It really just looks like common cold with cough and fever. That is going to progress to the paroxysmal phase. This is our whooping phase of a bordetella pertussis infection. The destruction of the ciliated epithelium uh, causes a decreased clearance of mucus. Now we need to clear that mucus, but this, we don't have the cilia to do that. Why don't we have cilia? Well, we have pertussis toxin here that we talked about. This pertussis toxin is causing an increase in CIMP, destruction of those cilia, increased edema in the wall of our respiratory tree. <clears throat> so that whoop on inspiration, cough, 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 <gasps> cough, 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 <gasps> is the whoop, okay? Uh, we may even vomit as a result of coughing. I literally saw this on my step one exam that they described a child who was vomiting after coughing. I don't know if you guys have seen this on UWorld questions. I believe it's even on UWorld questions, but that is really just like a, a gift. Like here, please, please take this question, get it right, and move to the next question because... Um, they give you that. They really give you that, which is makes it super obvious, right? Um, after our paroxysmal phase, we have a convalescent phase where the whoop kind of goes away, but we're still having some residual cough. Convalescent phase can go for a long time. Convalescent phase can go for months. Six months, our patient can still be infected with his bordetella pertussis. Okay? Great. So we have our DAPT vaccine or our Tdap vaccine, either one, with the acellular bordetella component. And we can give erythromycin prophylaxis to anyone with contact of our patient who is infected. Okay. All right. So those are two bacterial causes. Moving into our viral causes, we have our parainfluenza virus causing croup and our RSV causing bronchiolitis. Now, there these two are very, very different. They, are they in the same family? Yes, they're both in the paramyxo family. However, the way that they present, the way that they manifest their infection makes them very different. So we're gonna talk about what those differences are so we never get them confused, okay? So parainfluenza virus causes croup, which is an obstruction of the trachea. That's pretty high in our respiratory system, right? Our trachea, is all the way up here. Now, our RSV is gonna be an infection of terminal bronchioles, holy cow. So not only are we have we gone to the bronchi, we've gone to the mid-sized bronchi, we've gone to the small bronchi, and now we are in the terminal bronchioles, okay? So this is where RSV is going to cause an infection. This is where parainfluenza is gonna cause an infection. Very different anatomy in these two areas, okay? And so they're gonna present very differently. So going back to our croup and obstruction of the trachea. Here we are worried about kids, very young children. The parainfluenza has some H and F peplomers, great. Um, and essentially it causes its uh, manifestations via epithelial cell destruction, okay? What we look for on x-ray is a steeple sign because we have an infection here at the trachea, we want to look for some sort of manifestation here at the trachea. So what the manifestation is, is at the very proximal trachea, we're going to have some narrowing uh, resulting in something called a steeple sign, right? So steeple of a church kind of looks pointy like this. Uh, and this is what we look for on x-ray is a steepling of our trachea. Very hard to get through air through there, right? Here's our epiglottis up top. So we have air coming in and it's going to be trying to get through this very narrow passageway. 
Okay. And so what is that going to sound like? Well, number one, we want to hear upper airway sounds, meaning if we were to put our stethoscope at the chest, maybe at the lower lobe, we would hear a distant kind of whooshing sound of air, not a wheezing. We would not hear wheezing. We would hear a distant whooshing sound as air very far away from where our stethoscope is, is trying to get into this narrow trachea. Okay. So a distant whooshing sound and on inspiration, you will hear a barking cough almost described as a seal like cough, right? You've seen seals, uh, you know, by uh, the beach in California, they go, oh, 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 right? That's what we're looking for in this uh, croup, really associate it with that barking cough, because that's how it's going to be described in your question stem, okay? Otherwise, we're not looking for viremia or a systemic disease, and the super high yield thing that should have five stars by it is for croup, what we want to do is to give inhaled epinephrine. Inhaled epinephrine is going to allow for dilation of the trachea. It's going to allow for dilation of our smaller bronchioles. Okay, epinephrine is going to bind to those beta two receptors that are in our respiratory system. I'm excuse me, beta one receptors in our respiratory system and allow for dilation. Very very important. Okay. No, the beta two receptors, not beta one. All right. Beta-2 receptors in our respiratory system, binding those receptors allows for dilation of these airways and it's going to be very important for these patients with croup. Croup equals give inhaled epinephrine, okay? Because I'll tell you what, you are going to have questions on your step one where you have a patient with epiglottitis. They've described it perfectly for you. You know exactly what to look for. You you see the thumb sign. You see the drooling. You see the respiratory distress. You hear the strider. You say, oh my God, I know exactly what this is. And then you look at the answer choices. You don't see anything you like. And then there's inhaled epinephrine there. And you're going to say, wait, I know inhaled epinephrine is given for some one of these upper respiratory tract infections. Which one was it? Let me just go with that. No. Inhaled epinephrine is given for croup. Why? Because it dilates the respiratory tree. The epiglottis is not part of the respiratory tree, so we do not need to give epinephrine in epiglottitis. We need to give epinephrine in croup so that we can dilate the respiratory tree and allow more air to get to our alveoli. Okay? Very, very important. Okay, so that's our parainfluenza virus. Our respiratory syncytial virus causes a bronchiolitis, so we're looking here in terms of our respiratory system. Bronchioles is the same exact place where asthmatics have their problems, right? Asthmatics have spasming of their bronchioles. The muscle, smooth muscle in the wall of their bronchioles starts spasming. And that's why we give them albuterol, okay? So let's keep that in mind uh, in terms of presentation that asthmatics kind of have a similar problem. So let's go on here. Uh, infants are what we're really worried about. Here we have an F peplomer instead of H and F, great. Uh, again, epithelial cell destruction, really, really causing an infection the same way, just in a different place. Okay, so in terms of clinical symptoms, here we're initially going to have upper respiratory tract infection, progression to, oh my god, wheezing. Well, we said that asthmatics have a problem in the same area. Guess what? Asthmatics have wheezing. So this is the way that you're going to remember RSV with its clinical presentation. Because wheezing is not going to be one of the symptoms if they give you croup. Wheezing is not going to be the symptoms for pertussis or whooping cough. Wheezing is not going to be there for influenza. Wheezing means we're having air trying to go through these tiny little terminal bronchioles and those bronchioles are, are, are closed off a bit, okay? That's what wheezing means. That's why we hear it in asthmatics and that's why we hear it here. Uh, shortness of breath, tachypnea, rails. Uh, intercostal retractions is something that you really see in babies. Here, what you're seeing is the muscles um, in between the ribs, are being uh, are being activated in order to try and get a breath in. Okay, that's the intercostal retractions um, that you see in respiratory distress of infants. Not necessarily from bronchiolitis, but any respiratory distress in an infant can result in intercostal retractions. Okay. Here we have the most common cause of viral pneumonia in children. So how do we treat this? We're going to give bronchodilators, okay? Our albuterol works in the same place. Great, let's give albuterol. 
RSVIG, we can give an immunoglobulin to fight it. We can give aerosolized ribavirin, which is a um, anti um, RSV uh, antiviral, okay? Uh, and we'll give RSV prophylaxis for children under two with chronic lung disease, okay? That's a little bit of step two type stuff that you should understand, but um, in terms of step one, just know what is gonna be our treatment for each of these. Some of them do not have treatments, right? Um, but uh, keeping in mind what is the mechanism here, bronchodilators make sense, albuterol makes sense, okay? Questions on these four, very, very high yield um, conditions here, right? If you master these four, that's a huge chunk of the uh, microbiology questions in pulmonary that you're gonna get is these four, okay? So let me just check and see if Toby is chit-chatting. I don't see anything from Toby. Okay, Eva is good. So let's keep it moving here. Moving on to lower respiratory tract. For typical pneumonia, typical pneumonia is described as a rapid acute onset of productive purulent cough. I wanna see mucus coming out when our patients are coughing. I wanna see yellow mucus coming out when our patients are coughing. That is a typical pneumonia. Shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, pleuritis. Pleuritis, meaning we have inflammation of the pleura. The pleura is right outside of the lung, right? It's lining the lung. If we have an entire lobe of our lung that is infected, we should have some inflammation of that pleura. High fever, shortness of breath, and, and a rapid heart rate. Okay, so number one for our community-acquired pneumonia is gonna be our strep pneumo, okay? Uh, Gram-positive diplococci, lancet-shaped, encapsulated. If there is a bacteria to make best friends with and know every single detail about, do it to strep pneumo, okay? Strep pneumo is your most common cause of meningitis in adults. It's your most common cause of otitis media in adults. It's your most common cause of pneumonia in adults, okay? And so those are some pretty significant conditions, something you're gonna see quite a bit. So make best friends with strep pneumo, learn, learn everything you can about it so you won't miss a question because they're gonna ask you about it. Virulence factors here, capsule, okay? So we need to worry about our splenectomized patients. IgA protease, this is how it's able to cause all these infections in areas where we should have protection from IgA, right? Our middle ear and our um, respiratory tract should have protection from IgA. Guess what, strep pneumo has a protease that's gonna hi -ah, karate chop that IgA in half and protect itself. Uh, it's neuraminidase is gonna thin the secretions. Uh, pneumolysin is gonna cause pores in the cells of our respiratory tract. It's gonna be cytotoxic to polymorphonucleosides like our neutrophils and macrophages, epithelial cells. Uh, it's gonna inhibit cilia movement, activates complement, inflammatory cytokines. Oh my God, what doesn't this guy do, okay? So it's gonna be activating inflammation. It's gonna be chopping up our, antibi our antibodies and it has a special pneumolysin that causes pores and damages tissue in our respiratory tree, okay? Alpha hemolysis on blood agar. That is super helpful in terms of diagnosis, okay? We talked about our levels of hemolysis. We said beta hemolysis is the greatest amount of hemolysis. Alpha is the second amount of hemolysis, and then gamma is where you barely have any hemolysis at all, okay? So beta is the most, alpha is second, and gamma is the least amount of hemolysis, okay? We also have this biosolubility, optogen sensitive, um, you know, varying levels of um, yieldness there, not terribly high yield, new food quellong, I didn't really see too many questions on that. Here we are looking for a low bar pneumonia. When we have our right lung here and our left lung here, we are going to have an entire lobe affected, okay? When we look at the x-ray, it should look a bit like this, with a bunch of clear lobes and then one lobe that is completely opaque, infected with our strep pneumo, okay? That's a lot different from when we have, you know, uh, some of these other pneumonias we're gonna talk about, okay? Low bar pneumonia. Uh, this can cause post-influenza secondary pneumonia, but I really want you to associate post-influenza pneumonia with this bad boy, okay? Uh, strep or uh, Staph aureus, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, we do uh, have an easy treatment for strep pneumo, penicillin, oh my God. Penicillin, any of its derivatives can be helpful for this. I'm talking about the cephalosporins. I'm talking about the ampicillins. 
right? Any of these penicillin derivatives will be helpful against strep pneumo, okay? So keep them in your wheeled house. Um, otherwise, fluoroquinolones can also be helpful for strep pneumo, okay? Uh, vaccines, we have a capsular vaccine, PCV23. This is for high-risk people under two, uh, greater than two years old and greater than 65. Uh, conjugated is going to be conjugated, uh, you know, uh, sugar, essentially, and this is going to be children as young as two months, okay? Great, so 23 has more numbers in it than 13, so just remember that 23 is for older people who have more numbers, right? As we get older, we accumulate the numbers. I have 31 numbers myself. Um, uh, however, when I get to 65 numbers, I'm going to want that 23, okay? Versus our 13 is much less. This is for children. Okie dokie. Great. So that's our strep pneumo. There's much to learn about strep pneumo. If you go in your first aid book, I would say whatever's in there, try and memorize that because this is a very high yield bacteria. Staph aureus, when we talk about Staph aureus in the lungs, there's two cases where we talk about Staph aureus in the lungs. Number one is a pneumonia after having the influenza virus. Your immune system's down because of that influenza virus. Staph aureus is everywhere around us. Staph aureus gets into our, uh, gets into our lungs and causes an infection, okay? So that's the first time. The second time we talk about staph aureus and the lungs is in an abscess formation in people who aspirate food, okay? Uh, and so those are the two ways that we can have staph aureus and talk about it in the lungs. Classic gram-positive cocci clusters. I think this is the first bacteria most of us learn about, right? Because it's so ubiquitous. Um, you just cannot get away without seeing some Staph aureus in your life. There's this um, virulence factor called pantin valentine toxin. Uh, essentially, it's just a hemolysin. It, it's what gives um, uh, Staph aureus its beta hemolysis powers, right? It's also got a bunch of other uh, very damaging enzymes coded to it. So, uh, you know, it, it's somewhat important, pantin valentine toxin. It essentially allows for hemolysis, destruction of red blood cells, okay? Great. So we can grow this on MSA. Uh, it's catalase positive, coag positive, and beta hemolytic, very helpful. Here we look for MPMO, which is pus in the pleural cavity. We can also have a hemorrhagic necrotizing pneumonia, where we have tissue destruction, cavitation, patients are coughing up blood, abscesses, and of course that post-influenza pneumonia. I would say this is the most important thing for you to memorize for Staph aureus in pulmonology is this post-influenza pneumonia. You will have questions on it, I guarantee it, okay? Great, so uh, next we have our Pseudomonas, usually a hospital-acquired pneumonia, gram-negative, aerobe, requires air to grow, and so lungs are a great place for it, right? This is opportunistic, so we need to look for someone who is immunocompromised or hospitalized. Uh, what are some of the variance factors? This gets asked about a lot. Uh, so Pseudomonas has biofilms, has these exotoxins, which causes ADP ribosylation of the E2F blocking protein and synthesis. We talked about that um, same toxin when we talked about our diphtheria right? Diphtheria had a very similar toxin. It was an AB toxin, but it caused ADP ribosylation of that E2F blocking protein synthesis, okay? Uh, E2F is one of the factors needed for the ribosome to move from point A to point B when it's translating from the mRNA. Uh, I, I hope I'm, I'm jogging your memory in terms of biochemistry and how ribosomes work. We have three three places on the ribosome, the E site, the P site, and the A site, in order for the ribosome to read the codon, a codon is three nucleotides that codes for a certain protein, or uh, amino acid, I should say. In order for it to finish reading one codon and move to the next one, it requires a lot of extra factors. So there's E1, E2F, uh, E3, there's a whole bunch of these little proteins that help with moving the ribosome from one codon to the next, okay? Very important for protein synthesis. If you ribosylate it, uh, it's going to stop that E2F from working. Now the ribosome can't move along the mRNA. It's stuck, protein synthesis stops, okay? Hopefully, hopefully I jogged your memory a little bit with biochemistry. You, you do have to know some of that stuff for step one, okay? Uh, great. So diagnosis, oxidase positive. Uh, we can look for that uh, pigment 
that Pseudomonas has a nice green pigment that you can see. Um, bilateral bronchopneumonia on chest x-ray. Bronchopneumonia means the, the pneumonia is involving the bronchi, right? Bronchopneumonia makes sense, right? So we, what we should see is when we look at our x-ray, if I can draw, thank you. If I can draw here, here's our trachea going into our bronchi. Uh, what we'll see is a lot of inflammation diffusely. Wherever we see bronchi, wherever we see these terminal bronchioles, we're gonna see a bit of inflammation, okay? That's our bronchial pneumonia. It looks a lot different from our lobar pneumonia, okay? I should have added an image in here so you can kind of see the difference. Um, I, think, I think you should do yourself a favor and Google uh, bronchopneumonia chest x-ray after our lesson today and sort of look at how it's different from some of our other pneumonias, our atypical pneumonia from mycoplasma, for example. It looks a lot different. Okay, so bilateral, great, fever, chills, dyspnea. Um, we can have aspiration pneumonia due to mechanical ventilation, right? You have to talk about ventilation-associated pneumonia. There are different types of pneumonia that are associated with patients on ventilators. Also, very high yield here is our, our cystic fibrosis patients. If you have a patient with cystic fibrosis, they get pneumonia, choose pseudomonas. Choose pseudomonas, okay? Uh, just a very high association there, very important and high yield. Okay, we're going to give combo antibiotics. The classic example is going to be PIP Tazo, which is Piperacillin Tazobactam. Um, and that duo is really Piperacillin is a penicillin derivative, and Tazobactam is one of the, um, the basically to block the beta lactamases that bacteria produce. Um, and so that is going to be really strong against pseudomonas in most cases. Okay. For our hospital acquired pneumonia, number one is going to be our Klebsiella. It has a capsule. Great. Um, Klebsiella pneumonia. Really, we look for el older patients, alcoholics, diabetics, immune compromised. This causes a low bar pneumonia. And we look for this current jelly sputum with Kle Klebsiella. There's a really great image of. Um, on Sketchy Micro, I don't know if you guys use Sketchy, but on Sketchy, um, they show Klebsiella as uh, this really nasty current jelly jam on the patient's table. Um, and Klebsiella is like a dinosaur or something walking through the jelly. I don't know, it's bizarre, but I, it, I always picture that and it helps me remember Klebsiella is associated with this current jelly sputum. Okay, high yield buzzword. All righty. So here we're gonna use fluoroquinolone, cephalosporins, and uh, okay, great. Great, great, great. Okay, so a lot of different causes of pneumonia. I'd really like you to really focus in on strep pneumo, learn all you can about it, what are the best medications for it, uh, what does it look like clinically, um, and, and I really want you to kind of dive into the details here, and, and you should be comfortable with the idea that if I saw a patient with strep pneumo, their chest x-ray would look different than the chest x-ray of a patient with pseudomonas, okay? Be comfortable with that idea because these pneumonias are really gonna start to run together for you as you study. It happens to me. Um, I'm sure it happens to most people. Maybe it doesn't happen for you too, but it definitely happens for me. And so the way that I have to get through this is I convince myself that when I read the question stem of a patient that has a strep pneumo, it's going to look different than a patient with pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, I will see different things on chest x-ray. My patient is going to look a bit different. And, um, you know, they, they will give me something. They will give me something in the question stem to push me in either direction. Okay, because these are very different. They're not, it's not just one big thing, pneumonia, all pneumonias together. No, they, these are a little bit different. Okay, great. So uh, lower respiratory tract continuing. Here's our atypical pneumonia. So we look for fatigue, fever. This is kind of like a gradual, indolent course, a non-productive cough, chest pain. Uh, and then in the x-ray, we look for interstitial infiltrates, okay? So for our chest x-ray, uh, we talked about low bar, how that looks. We talked about how bronchial pneumonia, we're really gonna see the inflammation around the bronchi. Um, for our interstitial infiltrates, the entire x-ray is just gonna be whited out. The lungs are going to be completely whited out with so many tiny little uh, infiltrates and, and little white dots and opacities. Uh, that's our interstitial infiltrate. Okay, It looks different from bronchial. It looks different from lobar. 
Okay, so the most common cause here is going to be our mycoplasma pneumoniae. Uh, this is our cell wallless bacilli, extracellular, and aerobic. Okay, zero cell wall, which is why it's a mycoplasma. Uh, you know, uh, crowds we really look for. Uh, typically in the winter, we really look for this. Um, it, virulence factors for mycoplasma, we have this H2O2 production. It has a P1 attachment. Great. Some of the more important things that I'd like you to remember that are special about this uh, is that it's associated with this Raynaud's phenomenon as well as these cold agglutinins. Okay, so cold agglutinins can cause uh, the cold hemolytic anemia where when your blood cells reach the periphery, there are IgMs there that can bind to it, opsonize it, and destroy it. Okay, but that only happens in the periphery. That's why it's a cold hemolytic anemia. Okay, and so this is something that is associated with mycoplasma and pneumonia, and one of our causes of uh, cold agglutination is mycoplasma and pneumonia. Okay, so this is IgMs, IgMs, and they opsonize our red blood cells, causing hemolytic anemia in the periphery. Okay, not in the spleen. Um, and not in the liver, but in the small capillaries of our fingers, of our toes, places like that. Okay, uh, we can see some Raynaud's phenomenon, right? So uh, changing of color of our fingers due to vasoconstriction, wheezing because we're involving some of the lower respiratory tract, uh, patchy and diffuse pneumonia on chest x-ray. We can give antibiotics. Usually the antibiotics we'll want to give is going to be macrolides. We can give macrolides and we can give uh, tetracyclines. Okay, I can't write down there. Sorry, tetracyclines. Okay, tetracyclines and macrolides are going to be our go-to antibiotics. Okay, uh, Legionella. This is uh, one of those uncommon uh, bacteria that has a bunch of buzzword stuff attached to it. So it's good to know. Uh, typically, we're looking for old AC units people that have had a lot of exposure to saunas, showers, really just sort of this very moist environment uh, tend to foster Legionella uh, pneumophilia. Uh, I'm not really too worried about the virulence factors. How do we diagnose it? Silver stain, we're going to see a macrophage with these rods inside. This is an intracellular bacteria, so the bacteria should be inside of the macrophage. Makes sense, right? Uh, we can culture this on iron plus cysteine agar giving us black colonies. And also we can see our Legionella antigen in the urine. Very easy way to test for this is to get our patients to pee in a cup. Pee in a cup and we will test that for the Legionella antigen, okay? That there is no other pneumonia where you can pee in a cup and diagnose it, right? Am I wrong? I can't think of anything where you can pee in a cup and diagnose a pneumonia. So Legionella, uh, is pretty special for that, okay? Um, so clinical indications, what do we see? Uh, Pontiac disease is really where we just see a fever, myalgias, no GI symptoms, uh, no pneumonia. It's really going to be kind of self-limiting, okay? However, our Legionnaire's disease is our legion legionellosis or Legionnaire's disease is going to be patients who have underlying um, immune compromised conditions, here we're going to have that atypical pneumonia with that low fever, the cough, the fatigue, everything we described with walking pneumonia. And then we'll also have watery diarrhea, okay, vomiting, myalgias. The other thing you're going to look for is low sodium, hyponatremia. For whatever, re for whatever reason, Legionella causes a uh, loss of sodium at the level of the kidneys. Very bizarre, I know. Um, and so that's something that they may ask you about, okay? Great. Antibiotics are helpful here. We're going to use fluoroquinolones. Okay. Great. Chlamydophilia pneumoniae, very uncommon here. We're getting into the less and less common. Obligate intracellular. It has these two forms of the entry form and the, or there's the elementary form and the, um, and the reproductive form, I believe, is the EB and the RB forms. And so the elementary form is what's used to get into cells. Reproductive form is what it changes into once it's inside of a cell in order to multiply. 
Okay. So we're going to look for mild signs and symptoms, but when we look at the chest x-ray, we're going to be like, oh my God, this patient is about to die, right? We're going to look at the chest x-ray and look at it completely whited out, looking like ARDS. We're going to say, oh my God, this patient is about to die. Then you go see your patient and they're just going, <clears throat> right? Very mild signs and symptoms, but a more severe chest x-ray. This is also true of our mycoplasma pneumoniae, okay? Very, very scary looking chest x-ray with a very benign patient presentation. Okay? Great. Uh, so uh, more severe respiratory, uh, acute respiratory disease are our SARS virus and our MERS virus. These are both part of the coronaviridae family. Um, and uh, SARS can be found in wild domestic animals. Um, the risk is gonna be elderly or immunocompromised. Um, we have some virulence factor here, including an enzyme that, uh, a protein that inhibits the ACE receptor. Okay. That's pretty unusual. What do we look for? High, high fever. This is going to be a big part of our clinical presentation. I'm talking like 104.9, very high fever should start, um, cluing you in, right? When, when I say very high fever, you should not think about, uh, you know, your, give me an example, E. coli pneumonia, right? You shouldn't be thinking about pseudomonas. You shouldn't really even be thinking about um, your strep pneumo. Those have fevers, but not high, high fevers. When I say high fever, I want you to think about your influenza and I want you to think about your SARS, okay? Because these viruses directly stimulate our, um, our hypothalamus to increase the body temperature, okay? So high, high fever, non-productive cough, myalgias, shortness of breath. Unfortunately, there is no real effective treatment. We do need to, um, you know, prevent transfer of this virus to other people. Very important, okay? Our MERS virus causes a hemorrhagic uh, respiratory disease. Very, very bad. Uh, we're looking for a history of travel to the Middle East, okay? Great. So fungal pneumonia, these are our immune compromised patients. Three types we have to talk about, histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, blastomycosis. And I know you guys, I'm going very fast today. Um, I'm sorry about that, but you know there is a lot to go over in terms of microbiology. I want you guys really to be ready. Um, uh, so on this slide, um, you know I can kind of slow down a little bit and have um, someone tell me, uh, with histoplasmosis, for example, what history are you looking for for your patient? Eva, can you tell me uh, a patient history that might make you think of histoplasmosis as a cause of your pneumonia? Sorry? Yes. Good, good. So we're looking for caves. We're looking for, you know, uh, uh, you know, having been um, around bats um, in a cave or um, you know, bird droppings, inhalation, um, especially in that uh, Ohio area. That's going to be our our most likely um, association with this. Okay, um, Eva. Uh, I'm not sure if my audio is working. Would you mind just like saying la la la? So just test it really quick. Okay. Okay. Is it better or worse? Better. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. So uh, continuing with our uh, histoplasmosis. Um, you know, so all of these are going to be dimorphic fungi, meaning they have two forms. Whenever they talk about dimorphic fungi, think about these three bad boys, histo, coccidio, and blasto. When it's cold, they have one form. When it's hot, they have another form. Okay. So histoplasmosis uh, is going to be an atypical pneumonia. We can look for coin lesions on chest x-ray. So kind of think about oh, what, what would a TB look like with a coin lesion. That's what you should see. Chronic histoplasmosis, we have larger consolidations, typically in patients with COPD, some underlying immunocompromise, we said. 
And then also I really want you to uh, keep in mind that histoplasmosis, especially in our HIV patients, can disseminate. So when histoplasmosis goes extrapulmonary, we're looking at liver, spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes. Anywhere white blood cells live, that's where histo wants to go. Okay, just associate histo with white blood cells. When histo disseminates, it goes where white blood cells like to go. Liver, spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes, all those places with white blood cells, boom, histo is there. Okay, we're not going to say that when we talk about coccidia or blasto. Those are going to look different when they go systemic. Okay, disseminated histo, we're at no skin lesions here. No um, GI manifestations. Here we are looking for uh, dissemination to extrapulmonary sites. We can look for lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. So coccidiomycosis, uh, Toby, uh, you can put it in the chat box if you'd like. What sort of history are you looking for uh, in a patient with coccidiomycosis? Uh, travel history or anything else? Excellent. Good. Desert. So we're looking somewhere in the um, western states, um, you know, uh, southwest, southern California. Uh, there was, uh, I think, like 10, 15 years ago, a really severe uh, earthquake in California um, and a more deserted section of California outside of L.A. And it kicked up a whole bunch of dust. All of a sudden, they had this huge increase in the number of people presenting with atypical pneumonia. Come to find out that these patients were all having fungal atypical pneumonia from coccidiomycosis. That when they kicked up all that sand, it kicked up a bunch of this bacteria, um, fungus. Okay. So atypical pneumonia, that non-productive cough, nothing new there. However, we will see erythema nodosum. Okay. This is a tender red inflammatory nodules or erythema multiforme. Okay, so look on the skin when it comes to coccidio. Okay, we will see some um, dermatological manifestations, some red spots that are tender to touch. Okay, that's coccidio. Great. Chronic coccidiomycosis, looking for night sweats, weight loss, uh, fibrosis of the lungs. When coccidio goes extrapulmonary, here it's going to uh, just sort of go everywhere in the body. Nothing super specific, um, but uh, typically in patients with HIV, lymphoma, and cancer, we can have that extra pulmonary. And it's just going to cause an infection that causes that weight loss and uh, night sweats that we talked about before. Okay? Great. Last, for our blastomycosis, here we are looking for hunters, campers, forest workers. This uh, particular fungus likes to live on decompressing, uh, decomposing um, plant life. Okay. So think about like a, an old tree that fell onto the ground. Someone sets up camp right next to it. It's kicking around in that old decompressing wood. They might be kicking up some of this blasto. Okay. Now, as long as they're not immunocompromised people, we're, they're really not going to have that big of a problem. Okay. But, uh, if they do end up getting infection, when we do our KOH, we're going to look for this broad based bud. This is something that I've seen over and over. Blasto, broad, based, bud, blasto, based, bud, broad. Okay, just add all those Bs together. Blasto, broad, based, bud. That's what you see on KOH due to this thick capsule. Okay, broad, based, bud. It's a lot of fun to say. I recommend saying it. Okay, the two, the two really fun things to say are uh, broad, based, bud, and Weibel, Pilati, body. Okay, those are the fun ones to say. <laughs> So here we have more of a typical pneumonia, productive cough with, you know, a lot of mucus coming up, eventually progressing to hemoptysis, some blood coming up as well. Uh, typically, it's going to involve the lower lobes in terms of consolidations. When blasto goes 
Uh, extra pulmonary. This one I really want you to know. We have some dissemination to skin, giving us pustule ulcers and granulomas. You can see in this gentleman here with these huge pustules and granulomas on his nose, this is a disseminated blastomycosis. I think you can agree with me that that looks a lot different than someone, say, with disseminated histoplasmosis, who just has hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. Okay, someone with extra pulmonary coccidiomycosis who just has night sweats and weight loss. Okay, so these all look very different and um, they uh, have very different uh, patient histories as well. Okay, great. Okay, so different uh, zoonotic, very, very rare causes of, of pneumonia here. Uh, our anthrax is a gram-positive bacilli. This was a question on my step one exam. Um, you know, they gave me anthrax. They told me everything about anthrax, and then they asked me what it was. And uh, luckily, I did remember it was gram-positive, so so will you. Um, they love talking about this hide, people that work with hides, right? Hide means uh, just like a bunch of like a le giant leather thing or, a, or a, an animal skin, I guess, is a hide, right? Uh, so people that work with sheep hide, um, cow hide, leather, again, um, have a risk of inhaling anthrax, okay? So it's got this polypeptide capsule with this poly-D glutamic acid, um, a bunch of other anthrax toxins you can review on your own time. On uh, diagnosis, this widened mediastinum because anthrax is going to the lymph nodes in the mediastinum and in the, um, in the hyla of the bronchi, we can see some widened mediastinum there uh, uh, progressing to hemorrhage. Okay, So look for this. It starts with atypical pneumonia. It's going to move to massive chest edema, uh, mediastinal lymphadenitis, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Okay, we want to give antibiotics quick, and uh, we do have a vaccine if you're in the military. Uh, tularemia, you know, this is the one associated with rabbits. Uh, it's got a capsule, uh, and here um, we can use our aminoglycosides in terms of our antibiotic treatment. Okay, we'll go for our aminoglycosides. Okay, so maybe our tobramycin, right? Uh, one of those types of drugs. All right, uh, Yersinia pestis, pneumonic plague. Uh, this is really associated with rodents. It's got a bunch of different uh, virulence factors, including this YAP protein. And so some bacteria have secretion symptoms, uh, symptoms, systems that cause, that enable rapid secretion of different um, toxins, okay? So Yersinia pestis is one of these. It has a YAP secretion system. Just That just happens to be the name of it. We're going to have a typical pneumonia here with hemoptysis, and a bubonic plague is associated with swollen lymph nodes, or buboes, which is with a necrotic lymph node, okay? Uh, shock and death, we need to isolate these patients for sure, okay? And then hantavirus causes a very severe interstitial pulmonary edema, respiratory failure, very serious, very serious uh, virus, but very rare in terms of testing, okay? Our opportunistic pneumonias, pneumocystis gyrovici for our HIV patients, aspergillus as well uh, for immunocompromised COPD patients. Aspergillus is a pretty high yield fungus, I would say. It's monomorphic. When we look on our KOH, I want you to notice this acute angle branching. Okay, so a lot of times when we talk about some of these fungi, we're going to talk about the branching. Okay, for example, Rhizopus. Rhizopus is a fungus that causes a necrotic, uh, necrotic infection in uh, patients with hyperglycemia and um, diabetes. Right? Rhizopus uh, and mucor cause that very serious um, necrotic um, infection of the sinuses. That has a 90 degree branch. Rhizopus. Okay. Aspergillus has acute angle branching. So whenever you see the branch, you're going to see a, a small acute angle, right? Remember when we talked about acute angles in geometry class as kids, we talked about um, those acute angles. So that's what we look for with Aspergillus, okay? And Toby said, new cases in China now. The Hantavirus, right? You're talking about the Hantavirus in China? Yersinia pestis? Oh my God. 
Very scary, very scary. I would not recommend going to China. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go to China, but you know, wear a mask. They, they all wear masks there. Why do you think they wear masks? They're trying to not get that Yersinia pestis. I, I understand it. It makes sense to me. Uh, so here, um, uh, yep, so we have those acute angle branching. I really want you to memorize this in associate with aspergillus. Aspergillus, I always just think about that A. A, aspergillus, A, acute, A, angle gives you that, um, what you're looking for with um, KOH or silver stain, okay? So we can have it atypical. The asper aspergillus is associated with a lot of different conditions. So an atypical pneumonia, we can have an allergic bronchopulmonary pneumonia where we have a little bit of aspergillus, not enough to cause a frank pneumonia, but our body overreacts to those antigens and causes a um, hypersensitivity reaction, okay? So in patients with asthma it's or uh, cystic fibrosis, we can get these pulmonary infiltrates, dry cough. Think about what would happen if you had a sudden increase in your IgE, right? That shouldn't be there. Um, this is something that we could look for. An aspergilloma is a fungal ball that we see in patients that have a history of a cavitory lung disease. Think tuberculosis, think sarcoidosis, think an abscess from Staph aureus. Anything that would leave a nice big hole in our lung, uh, aspergillus loves to go in there and just start growing like crazy. Okay? And we can just remove that surgically, although it is asymptomatic. All right? Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, we can get that fever, productive cough. Uh, this is patients with neutropenia, you know, patients that had a recent transplant. Um, but uh, in terms of how high yield, I would say definitely this allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, very important. Know that patients with asthma or cystic fibrosis can have this overreaction, this hypersensitivity reaction to the aspergillus um, antigens. Okay. Pneumocystis girovici, the only person that will ever get pneumocystis is an AIDS patient. Please do not choose pneumocystis if they haven't told you immune compromise or AIDS. It's the wrong answer, okay? The only person that gets this is a patient with AIDS for the most part, okay? Uh, this is one of the early AIDS lesions. When we talk about AIDS-defining infections, we break it down by CD4 uh, T-cell count. So we have the breakdown of two under 200, under 100, and under 50. Those are sort of the cutoff points, um, and we talk about different uh, infectious agents at each of those points. Okay, and so as you go further down, it's more, more and more severe. Okay, uh, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords associated with pneumocystis cup shaped trophozoites. Seeing a ground glass appearance on chest x ray um, is very, um, very high yield or buzzword, whatever you want to call it, for this particular pneumonia. Uh, looking for a non productive cough. Um, and so in terms of pathogenesis, organism is going to kill those alveolar epithelial cells, blocking gas exchange. So this is in the alveoli, right? We haven't talked too much about any of our infectious agents working at the level of the alveoli, right? We've talked about our trachea. We've talked about bronchi. We've talked about bronchioles. But actually at the level of the alveoli, where gas exchange is supposed to occur, that's where PCP manifests its infection, okay? So that's kind of important and special about PCP, all right? Remember this, that it works at the level of the alveoli, okay? We get these honeycomb appearing exudates. Uh, we can give azoles uh, and preventative therapy uh, as recommended for AIDS patients, okay? Great. All right, so uh, lower respiratory tract due to paras due to parasites. So our Ascaris lumbricoides uh, here, essentially um, when humans um, use um, fecal matter to fertilize their fruits and vegetables, as um, nutritious as that sounds, it actually has some problems with it. So you can end up ha passing along this Ascaris lumbricoides parasite worm. Um, this is going to be the most common human helminthic infection in the world. Okay, so this is definitely one to know. And it can cause a Loeffler syndrome, which is a pulmonary eosinophilia. Having a lot of eosinophils in your pulmonary system, in your pulmonary system because uh, eosinophils are what's going to be fighting off these uh, worms, parasitic worms. Okay, so these eggs are going to be in the feces. We can check our patient's feces for eggs. 
uh, rails on auscultation, infiltrates on chest X-ray. Uh, the initially we're going to have a GI infection. Uh, Ascaris lumbricoides, rather than creating one giant worm, Ascaris tends to create lots of little worms. Okay, and you can have an, end up having a worm ball in your GI tract, right? Yummy. I, I hope you all have had lunch already. Um, and so having this high load of worms can end up leading to obstruction or perforation. That tends to be in children. For adults, our GI tract is sort of wide enough or long enough that uh, we tend not to have obstruction. Rather than that, we end up with the pulmonary phase. So the migratory phase, those worms are going to be able to make it over the lining of our GI tract, go through the blood, past the liver, and make it to our lungs okay so the larvae are going to move to, through the tissues to the lungs uh, once those larvae are in the lungs we're actually going to cough them up and then swallow them back into the gut um, uh, which increases the amount of infection increases the amount of worm load this just makes me so sick even talking about this but <laughs> uh, I, I could never do infectious disease it's, it's just too much uh, we don't see any skin lesions, okay? So that's one thing. Uh, when you talk about strongyloides, strongyloides has a very similar presentation where we're coughing up larvae and swallowing them back. However, in strongyloides, we have larvae migraines where you can see in the skin uh, an inflammatory response to worms moving through the skin, okay? Great. So anti-helminths, albendazole, mebendazole, um, those are going to be really helpful. Okay, and for strongyloids, this tends to be a larger worm, um, and uh, we're not going to see eggs in the feces. We will still see that eosinophilia, and these are going to directly penetrate the skin. So strongyloides, I always imagine as these really strong worms that are just able to punch their way through the foot of their host and enter the skin that way. Okay, so strongyloids. They, you know, we have someone walking along the beach with no shoes. Strongyloids is going to punch their way through the skin and ultimately go to the lungs, where it's going to create uh, this a, this um, uh, typical pneumonia. Versus Ascaris lumbricoides, where we have people eating food contaminated with human fecal matter. Eggs go to the GI tract, migrate through the wall of the uh, GI tract, and make their way to the lungs. We cough these worms up, swallow them back. Okay. Great. All right. Also, one last thing. This Loeffler syndrome is associated with Ascaris. No other worms. Just Ascaris. Okay. Great. So, urinary tract infections moving away from our pneumonia into urinary tract infections. We have to sort of uh, go through the definitions um, uh, for our UTI. So, cystitis is just going to be infection of the bladder. So when you only have infection of the bladder, we really just see painful urination, increase of frequency, right? The wall of the bladder is gonna be irritated, so the frequency increases, the need goes up, we're gonna have some cloudy urine and some tenderness right above that pubic bone because you're pressing on an inflamed bladder, okay? If that uh, infection of the bladder progresses up to the kidneys, now we have a pyelonephritis, okay? So an infection of the kidney with a bacteria is a pyelonephritis, and it almost always, 99.9% .9 comes from a UTI, okay? So we're gonna have all the symptoms of cystitis because it's coming from a UTI, plus we're gonna have a fever, plus we're gonna have flank pain right at that costal vertebral angle, right? We're gonna bang, bang, bang on the back of our patient right at that CVA, and they're gonna say, ow, doc, why are you doing that? That hurts and that will give us our diagnosis. We can see hematuria, but that's really gonna be later on. You can have pyelonephritis without having hematuria. Don't get it uh, twisted. That can be there. It can be microscopic, meaning you would need a microscope to uh, even be able to see the blood in the urine, but it can be there. Okay, great. A lot of different causes for our UTIs. Uh, so our most common cause is going to be E. coli, uh, right here, which is our gram-negative bacilli. Uh, this is endogenous. This, it lives on our bodies. Uh, um, if you happen to be a female, you might have a shorter urethra than men. Hopefully you do. Um, and this bacteria is able to progress up that urethra much more quickly, making women, um, uh, being female, a risk factor for this particular bacteria. Okay. Uh, in terms of diagnosing this one, what we look for is indole-positive fermentation, 
Okay. Uh, in terms of diagnosing this one, it's very important to uh, differentiate it from your Klebsiella uh, in this one slide over. Klebsiella is almost the same in terms of lab diagnosis, except for this indole, uh, indole breakdown that uh, E. coli is able to do. Okay. It's able to break down indole, uh, giving you a positive reaction. Okay. So Klebsiella, very, very similar. Um, but here we really look for some sort of um, exogenous source. So Klebsiella is very common in patients who are catheterized or, or in the hospital. You've got that catheter inside. Bacteria is able to grow up the side of the catheter um, or even be at the tip of the catheter and introduced into the bladder. Okay. In diagnosing this, it is not an indole... indole uh, Excuse me. It's not able to metabolize indole, and so that's going to be our way of differentiating it from E. coli. All right. So let's pop back to this first cause, Staph saprophyticus. I don't need to say any more without you thinking new slash hyperactive sexual activity. What is hyperactive sexual activity? It depends on who you ask. Um, but uh, typically in the question stem, it will be described as a newlywed. So this is the... Uh, this is the UTI of newlyweds, okay? Surprisingly common. Uh, urotrophic adhesion helps, helps it uh, stick to the bladder lining. Uh, it is a staph uh, bacteria, right? So we can look for some of the things that staph typically has. Catalase positive. Uh, MSA agar non-fermenter. It is going to be coagulase negative. Gamma hemolysis. We're not going to see any hemolysis. Uh, however, it will be resistant to novobiosin, a particular antibiotic we can use to diagnose this. Here, uh, it causes acute urethral uh, syndrome with a cystitis with low bacterial count. Really, it's just an infection of the urethra itself rather than being a frank cystitis. Okay. Enterococcus is a member of the strep species, so you will see it called strep, streptococcus fecalis sometimes. Um, it's actually group D strep, right? We have our group A strep, group B strep. This is our group D strep. Um, and so here, this is an endogenous. So we're looking at females again. Um, catalase negative. It's going to have these uh, black uh, colonies and uh, really just treat it with combination of antibiotics, okay? Uh, Enterococcus fecalis. Uh, can also cause a infection of our biliary tree, causing a cholangitis, okay? And so uh, that's an important kind of crossover. If this particular bacteria is able to cross into the bloodstream from the bladder, we're worried about an infection of our biliary tree. We can also get a myocarditis, or, I'm sorry, an endocarditis, an infection of our heart valves from Enterococcus fecalis. So those are the three places we look for our group D strep. Our urinary tree, our urinary tract, our biliary tree, and our heart valves. Okay? Sort of a high yield point there. Urinary tract, our heart valves, and our biliary tree. Okay? I think this is from Sketchy, actually, that I'm remembering this. Okay, great. Klebsiella pneumoniae we talked about. Proteus, what's important about Proteus is this urease and its ability to cause these nephrolithiasis, struvite crystals, staghorn calculi. Essentially, Proteus is a bacteria that's able to cause kidney stones. And not just any kidney stones, really big, ugly kidney stones that are really just going to take up the entire pelvis of the kidney, okay? Very ugly looking things called staghorn calculi that take up the entire pelvis of the kidney, okay? Thank you to that urease positivity. It's also going to be called swarming. Why? It has this flagella where as soon as it gets up into the bladder, it's gonna swim up the ureters up to the kidneys, okay? So it's considered swarming. It moves very quickly up to those kidneys. Uh, Pseudomonas is also associated with some UTI, although uh, that's sort of a rare cause. Okay, uh, we have a BK virus. Uh, this is a virus that can cause renal stenosis, but we really just look for a history of renal transplant to give this renal stenosis due to BK virus, okay? This is very, very rare, but it's in here um, just for the sake of completeness. 
we look for someone who ha- has you know immunocompromised, secondary to a renal transplant. Uh, BK virus is really going to be everywhere. We all have BK virus or ex- been, have been exposed to BK virus. However, because we're not immunocompromised and we haven't had that low uh, white blood cell level in the kidney, we're not going to have this renal stenosis due to BK virus. Okay. So in terms of looking for uh, viral causes of urogenital infections, BK virus is going to be our major one. All right. This is part of the polyoma viridae family. There's one other member of the polyoma viridae family, and that is the JC virus. And what do these two have in common? JC virus causes our poly, uh, polyfocal, uh, polymorphic multifocal leukoencephalopathy, right? PML causes PML in patients with AIDS. Okay, and so both of these viruses cause their infections in patients who are severely immunocompromised. Okay, BK virus and JC virus, both part of the polyoma viridae family, both cause infections in people who are immunocompromised. Okay, one involves the kidney, one involves the central nervous system. Great. So moving on to urethritis and cervicitis, Neisseria gonorrhea. This is another one that you should be uh, best friends with. Uh, Not in real life, but for the purposes of step one, definitely get to know this one well. So uh, gram-negative diplococci, facultative intracellular can be intra or extracellular. Here we look for thick mucopurulent discharge. The, as gross as it sounds, the color, the thickness, the texture, the smell of discharge is going to be how we get to our diagnoses as we move into these urogenital infections, okay? So that's definitely something that I want you to keep an eye on because that is that is how they're going to expect you to answer these questions. They're going to describe a discharge for you and you need to know the bacteria that causes it, right? You have to be a discharge expert. So we're all going to be discharge experts, and we're going to say that a thick mucopurulent discharge, especially coming from the cervix, is due to Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, so if this is our cervix, uh, all right, there's the uh, fornix. Here is the discharge, very thick discharge coming out of our cervix, green, yellow, nasty stuff. Uh, sexually transmitted, I think we all knew that. Um, and we have these LOS uh LOS which blocks immune complexes from forming uh, we have pili with antigenic variation that allows it to avoid uh our own antibodies fighting it and IgA protease to fight off the IgA which is in the mucus lining of the inside of the vagina and in the male genital tract uh it does not have a capsule um if it also had a capsule that would really be a nightmare uh, lab diagnosis, we have Thayer Martin New York agar, which is a chocolate agar, right? Memorize this. This is an important way of diagnosing Neisseria gonorrhea. Oxidase positive, catalase positive, a glucose fermenter, great. Uh, if this cervicitis is able to progress up into the uterus through the fallopian tubes and then out of the fallopian tubes and into the pelvis, into the abdomen, we talked about pelvic inflammatory disease, right? We, we talked about pelvic inflammatory disease? We might have, we might have not, but essentially, uh, if this is our cervix, here's our uterus, here's a fallopian tube coming off the side. At the end of the fallopian tube, we have something called the ampulla, which is just sort of like an open space with a bunch of fimbrae, like fingers hanging off of it, and then here's our ovary, okay? Now, at the ampulla, this space is open and in continuation with the rest of our abdomen and pelvis, meaning... Things can come out of this ampulla quite easily, okay? And if those things happen to be uh, gonorrhea bacterium, we will have an infection that starts to involve all of the pelvic um, uh, organs that moves out of the pelvis, starts to involve the abdominal organs, okay? So pelvic inflammatory disease is a very important thing to keep in mind. If we don't treat uh, gonorrhea or uh, chlamydia promptly, our patient can end up with pelvic inflammatory disease. One of the long-term sequelae of pelvic inflammatory disease is that you're going to end up with stenosis of these um, of these fallopian tubes, okay? Our mothers may not be able to get pregnant after a bout of pelvic inflammatory disease, okay? So definitely important to have a prompt treatment of this particular bacteria. 
as the bacteria moves up the abdomen, starts to involve the liver, starts to involve the spleen, the stomach. Really, this bacteria is kind of growing everywhere. We're going to end up with something called Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Okay, Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome is, you can imagine, almost like a peritonitis where the bacteria is growing all through the peritoneum, all through um, the inside of our abdominal walls, just sort of like freely growing wherever it wants in there. And uh, in Fitzhugh Curtis, the classic thing you look for laparoscopically, so we enter the abdomen with a camera, right? We're going to put a little hole on the abdomen and enter with a camera. That's what laparoscopic means. When we enter with that camera, what we're going to see is if this is the abdominal wall and this is, say, the liver, we're going to see something called violin strings, which is just a these strings of inflammation that are irregular and growing from the um, the abdominal organs to the abdominal wall. Okay, they typically should not be there, but because of this pelvic inflammatory disease progressing to involve the abdominal organs, we're going to have this violin strings attachments or adhesions. Violin string. Okay. This is something that you're comfortable with, right? You, you all have heard of this, Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome and violin strings. It's certainly in your step one book if, uh, if you're not familiar with it. Okay, great. So one uh, best friend of gonorrhea is going to be our chlamydia trachomatis of the D through K subgroups. They are going to cause a uh, inflammation and cervicitis. Okay, so a friable cervix, meaning the cervix itself uh, is going to look a little bit red, a little bit bloody. And when, when we brush it with a Q-tip or we brush it with uh, one of the scrapers we use for our uh, pap smears, it's actually going to start to bleed. That's what we mean by friable. Friable. Friable, we're not talking about frying in a pan. We're talking about when something crumbles under a little bit of pressure. Okay, so that friable cervix, high yield may be the only finding. We have this uh, infective entry form and the RB is the re replicative form. Uh, same thing as we saw in our chlamydophilia um, or chlamydia pneumophilia, whatever the one was we talked about in pneumonia, had that EB and RB form. This is an intracellular organism. So it needs one form to enter cells and one form to start re uh, reproduction once it's inside. Okay, how do we diagnose this? It's going to be via looking for um, nucleic acids. Looking for nucleic acids. Okay, we can also do microscopy of a smear and see those inclusion bodies inside of ourselves. Our cells. Okay, uh, this can also cause a, a pelvic inflammatory disease. It really travels along with gonorrhea. So really, whenever we have a an infection with chlamydia, we're going to go ahead and treat for gonorrhea as well because we know that they tend to go together. So what we'll do is we'll get a tetracycline and a macrolide and that will cover both. Okay, we have a macrolide for the chlamydia and a tetracycline for the gonorrhea. Okie dokie. Great. Urea plasma really just cause a, causes a, um, an infection of the urethra. Okay, so if we have an infection only of the urethra, please select urea plasma. This can affect men or women. Okay, so if you have a patient who is having pain on urination um, and always feels the need to go, when you press on their suprapubic area, they don't have pain, meaning it's not a cystitis. That means you just have a urethritis. So that may be from urea plasma. Okay, we're looking for symptoms of UTI without the symptoms of cystitis, if that makes any sense to you at all. Um, essentially, just that pain on urination and sort of that, that sensation of always needing to go. They have an overgrowth of this uh, normal, endogenous, um, normal endogenous bacteria. Okay. Great. Okay, vaginitis and vaginosis. Getting back into our discharges again. We're going to start talking about discharge. So trichomonas vaginalis. Here, this is due to a protozoa. Protozoa. Not a bacteria. Not a yeast. Not a virus. But a protozoa. It has a flagella on the back of it. Okay, it's got this really nice looking um, 
uh, shape where you have the body of the protozoa and a little flagella on the end, okay? Sexually transmitted, uh, typically uh, vaginal pH will be uh, greater than 4.5, and we're looking for these mobile trophozoites on wet mount, and for the discharge, it's going to look frothy. It's going to be excessive, sort of bubbly, uh, thin discharge, okay? On the cervix itself, we should see small petechiae or bleeding spots. Now, I'm not saying friable. Chlamydia is friable. Chlamydia, when we rub on the cervix, it starts bleeding. Here, when we just open up the speculum and look at the cervix, we're going to see little red spots of petechiae. That's called our strawberry cervix, and that is typical of trichomonas. Uh, this picture right here is absolutely horrible. I'm very sorry about that, but um, essentially what you're looking for is on your cervix, uh, this is your cervix, you're going to see little spots, little tiny red spots, uh, which are your petechiae, okay? And that is very typical for trichomonas. That's something you should look for in the question stem. Uh, not really typical of anything else. Treatment here is our metronidazole. Metronidazole is a very uh, effective treatment for it. Okay. Uh, so our candida albicans is going to be a yeast that forms pseudohyphae, right? We're used to that in, in talking about uh, candida. Uh, this is an overgrowth. And so we're looking for a patient that is, say, a diabetic. Diabetics have a lot more sugar down there, and so they tend to have an overgrowth of uh, uh, fungus, okay? Their bacterial pH should be under 4.5, okay? We're looking for a very acidic um, vaginal pH because we're having breakdown of all those sugars. Sugars gets broken down into alcohol, right? Alcohol is acidic, so that makes sense. That goes together with it. Patients with long-term antibiotic use also uh, tends to kill off the normal bacteria uh, inside the vagina and, and can allow for overgrowth of candida. Okay, great. So looking for thick, white, clumpy discharge that kind of sticks to the wall a little bit, uh, yeasty odor, excoriation, scratches on the labia. That can be for either of the vaginitis. Vaginitis uh, is essentially when you have a lot of um, irritation. All right, so your patient is going to be itching down there, and uh, you should see some redness, some inflammation. Okay, that's true of both of those. However, however, for our Gardnerella vaginalis, really, we're not going to have a lot of that inflammation. We may still have irritation, we may still have a little bit of itching, but that inflammation won't be there, that redness, that uh, white blood cell count won't be there. Okay, Gardnerella vaginalis, they love asking about this. It is a gram variable pleomorphic rod. What does that mean? It's not gram positive, it's not gram negative, and the shape of the rod is changeable, okay? So it's very sort of uh, wishy-washy in terms of identification, but they do ask about this. It is gram variable, okay? Uh, facultative anaerobe. This is a normal floor of the urogenital tract, and it is an overgrowth rather than an STD, okay? Uh, so when we disturb the normal flora, we can have an overgrowth of Gardnerella. Uh, it's quite common. Uh, clue cells under the microscope where we have epithelial cells covered in uh, Gardnerella bacteria. Uh, a whiff test, uh, in addition to KOH, we get a very foul, fishy odor. Okay, this is one you can identify it before you even stick the speculum in. Uh, you know vaginosis is there. Okay, but in terms of identifying the discharge, this is going to be a thin and milky looking discharge. Okay, on the line, lining of the of the cervix, lining of the walls of the vagina, it's going to be a thin, thin discharge. Okay, lack of inflammation. So here we can give metronidazole. Guess what? Metronidazole is going to cover for uh, trichomonas as well. So that makes it easy to remember. Okay, great. So uh, these three, I'm sure you, you, you two are very comfortable with identifying them from each other. Um, you know, just keep in mind that, that, that identifying the discharge is going to be helpful for you in, in getting to your answer on test day. And the other thing is I didn't really emphasize is this pH bit. Um, when you have that low pH, that really tends to select more for this fungus, Candida, rather than Gardnerella or Trichomonas. Those, you're going to see a more basic vaginal pH, okay, greater than 4.5. Okay, so this pH bit is actually pretty important. I didn't really focus it too much, but definitely commit that to memory. Uh, but it's pretty easy to remember because for both um, our Gardnerella and our Trichomonas, it's both a basic pH versus the candida where we have more acidic pH. Okie dokie. 
Great. So cutaneous genital lesions getting into our STDs. Uh, we have our hemophilus ducreae, which is our painful uh, genital lesion. Klebsia granulomatis, which is not painful, but is very bloody. Chlamydia trachomatis, where we have pain in our lymph nodes. And syphilis, where we have a bump that is not painful. And a lot of other stuff too. Okay. So you should be able to, uh, boom, just go through like I did and be like, okay, uh, hemophilus, that's painful. Um, uh, Klebsiella, that's bloody, like I just did. Be able to do that on your own for each of these infections. There's a reason I, I made this in such a way where it's this nice chart. So you can cover up part of the chart and go through it and see how much you remember uh, and hopefully study it that way. So for this chancroid, you can see on this image here, we're going to have painful uh, with ragged edges. Okay, the lymph nodes in the area should be swollen and tender. And uh, that is typical of our Haemophilus do cry. Oh, the way that, that they always tell you to remember it is that you do cry with do cry, right? Haemophilus do cry, you, you do cry. Uh, Klebsiella granulomatis. Here we have a granuloma venerum. It's also called uh, donovanosis. Here what we look for is bright red, not painful, non-painful ulcers that bleed easily. So you look at this and you say, oh my God, that must be so painful. Actually, this one is not. Um, and so uh, that's how you know that it tends to be more this Klebsiella versus the Haemophilus, okay? Because they kind of look similar, right? Uh, this one is just a lot more red, a lot more beefy, a lot more red, and uh, that's how they describe it, okay? Look for a history of travel to um, tropics, uh, the southwest of U.S., uh, people that come from that live in that area or who have vacation there and, um, you know, um, had a little bit too much fun. Chlamydia trachomatis, this is the same chlamydia as the one we discussed about before, just a different set of subtypes. This is the L1 through L3. If you remember, the type we talked about before, chlamydia trachomatis was uh, types D through K, causing our cervicitis. Okay, so here, obligate intracellular again, everything the same again. We diagnose with uh, nucleotides, looking for those nucleotides. Um, but in terms of the infection, look for lymphadenopathy, often suppurative. We're going to have pus coming from these uh, lymph nodes. Uh, when they talk about suppurative lymphadenopathy, uh, one thing I'd like you to know um, is, you know, there's, so there's two types of lymphadenopathy, non-suppurative and suppurative. Non-suppurative is... Uh, the lymph nodes that you have, say you get the flu, right? Or say you get some upper respiratory tract infection, you feel your lymph node and it just feels like one round tough lymph node, right? It hurts a little bit when you press on it, but it's round and tough and, and it doesn't really move. When you have a suppurative lymph node, it's going to be painful. It's going to be round, but it's also going to be fluctuant. So as you touch your lymph node, you can feel fluid moving around inside the lymph node back and forth, okay? And that's the pus from this bacteria growing inside and uh, being broken down by all of the uh, macrophages and neutrophils and everything else in there. So we're looking for suppurative lymphadenopathy. As we touch the lymph node, it feels fluctuant. We can feel uh, fluid inside of this area. We have some painless ulcers and because we're involving the lymph nodes, we can end up with some genital elephantiasis as lymph tissue starts to accumulate into the genitals, okay? Syphilis is just another one of these bacteria that you really need to be best friends with. Uh, spirochete, uh, so you know it has this spiraling shape to it with axial fligaments, gram-negative microaerophile. Um, this can be transmitted sexually, can be transmitted through needles, transfusions, also transplacentally, giving you that congenital syphilis, which is quite sad. Uh, dark field microscopy slash silver stain is how we're going to diagnose this. And it is going to uh, have two ways of screening, which is our RPR VDRL. Uh, this is a great way to screen for it, but you can get false positives, right? False positives. What might give you a false positive for this particular test? What condition? If you get autoimmune, yes. <laughs> it's associated with lupus yes yes good so uh to be the you're 100 right it is associated with lupus to be super specific you would say antiphospholipid syndrome 
uh, is what actually gives you that cardiolipin antibody that gives you the false positive here. Okay, so far as false positive, anytime you have that cardiolipin, cardiolipin, okay, uh, which especially is in lupus, uh, just like you said, Eva, beautifully, uh, lupus, you end up with that cardiolipin antibody, um, which is your antiphospholipid syndrome antibody. Great. Uh, so because we didn't get those false positives, we're going to do our FTA antibodies to confirm that it is indeed syphilis. And that is a very sensitive, very specific test. So initially, we're going to start with these painless hard ulcers that look a bit like the ulcer of uh, Haemophilus ducri, except they do not hurt. Okay, painless and hard. Next, we have this condylomata lata which is these uh, maculopapular uh, moist velvety lesions. We can also get a rash on our palms and soles. And then stage three, we end up with gumas, neurosyphilis, um, you know, sort of loss of our nervous system. Uh, syphilis can really involve every single part of our body. It's a really remarkable. Um, it causes problems everywhere from our eyes, our nervous system, our skin. It really can have a manifestation everywhere. Now, we have a very, very good treatment for syphilis, which is penicillin. Believe it or not, penicillin G, you can give it IV and kill the penicillin. However, when you start giving penicillin, you're going to be breaking down all of these spirochetes, right? These spirochetes have a lot of inflammatory stuff inside. And when we release all of that extra inflammatory stuff, we're going to get something called the jerish herxheimer reaction, which can lead to endotoxic shock. A lot of these inflammatory mediators are being released and causing shock. Now, say you have a patient, you they have syphilis, you start giving them penicillin, and then they start developing this jerish herxheimer reaction. Okay, so what would you do? Option A, um, continue the penicillin, um, even though they have shock. Option B, stop the penicillin, wait for the shock to go away, and then start penicillin again. A or B. Continue. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, so uh, we are going to fight through this shock. We will give our vasopressors as we need to. We will give fluids as we need to. We will get through this endotoxic shock uh, and we will continue to give penicillin. Do not stop it. Keep going. Uh, you want to kill all the syphilis. Okay. Great. Uh, herpes virus. Uh, this is our double-stranded DNA virus. Um, here in order for diagnosing it, we'll do a Zank smear at the, at the base of a ulcer. So if this is our little herpes pustule, where we want to do the smear is right at the edge at the base, right? It should be crusted over even. We don't want to do it right in the middle. You'll do it right at the base. You'll do a smear of the edge of it and then put that under the microscope and look for syncytia. Herpes viruses can cause syncytia where they force a bunch of um, cells to become one cell. Okay, so we're uh, looking for vesicles on an erythematous base, right? Grouped vesicles on an erythematous base is your classic description of herpes. Grouped vesicles on an erythematous base. If I had a dollar for every time I read that phrase, uh, I would not need to be tutoring anymore, okay? Put it that way. Um, so these vesicles become painful ulcers, which then heal and crust. How do we treat it? We give a cyclovir and we do not stop a cyclovir because we do not have a uh, cure for herpes. By giving a cyclovir, we will prevent a recurrence of the vesicles. However, uh, the patients always have the possibility of having those vesicles again because it's latent in that sacral dorsal root ganglia. Okay. HPV uh, causes genital warts. It also causes cervical cancer. And so this is a type of genital virus that we like to vaccinate against. Okay. Sexually transmitted. Uh, what, what do we see on pap smear? Um, so our Papa Nicolau smear is where we uh, take a scraper and just rub it on the inside of the os of the cervix. We're going to take all those cells and look at them under a microscope. What do we look for? Coilocytes. Coilocytes, coilocytes. This will be a question on your exam. This will be a question during your during your clinical rotations. What do you look for? Coilocytes. Okay. In terms of our clinical uh, manifestations, we have condylomata cuminata. So on condylomata lata, we sort of had the of syphilis. We had very diffuse velvety lesions uh, in the general area. With condylomata cuminata, here we end up with an overgrowth. 
of these genital warts where they're actually growing on top of each other. There's so many of them. They're growing on top of each other, almost making like, think about a the crown of broccoli, right? Broccoli kind of has this growth where there's a lot of different... Um, you're never going to look at broccoli the same. This is Conolomata cubinata. Rather than having spread out these verrucous lesions, we're having a papillary type eruption of uh, warts. Okay. Can be more severe and you're immunocompromised. And HPV variants 16 and 18 are associated with cervical and rectal cancer. And so these are definitely the kind we want to vaccinate against. Okay. Virulence factors are E6 and E7 oncogenes. This is, oh my God, so high yield. So high yield. They did so much research to discover this that you know you're going to get a question about it. So the virus has these two um, these two oncogenes that interfere with our own cells producing its p53, producing its rb, which are our cell cycle mediators. Okay, now which does which? So you don't want to add these together and get a whole number. So that means you're going to add your e6 to p53. That comes to 59, right? So that means E6 messes with P53. E7 messes with your RB, okay? That's how I remember it. I know that's crazy, but uh, E6 is the one that interferes with P53. E7 interferes with RB. And I can tell you this was a question on my step one, and the way I remembered it is by remembering that there was no whole number involved, right? I'm weird. My, 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 brain, my brain works kind of in a strange way where, uh, you know, I just kind of put those numbers together if I don't get a whole number, then I'm good to go, okay? So six plus three is nine. So E6 messes with P53, E7 messes with RB, okay? Very high yield, very high yield. Write that down um, somewhere right now so that you don't forget it. Molluscum contagiosum uh, is what's going to give us our, uh, you know, genital uh, warts. Uh, this is a pox viridae. This is a virus, one of our largest viruses. I think it, this is the largest virus, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, contact sports are, are sexual partners. Um, we can see these Henderson-Patterson bodies. Not sure how high yield that is. But you do want to be able to see this molluscum body uh, when you do that biopsy. Okay, and so you can see the molluscum body in between our cutaneous cells here. Okay. Now, if you have a patient with warts and you see the warts growing like this, what other condition might you think that they have? Anybody can get one of these warts from molluscum contagiosum, but typically they'll just have one or two warts in an area looking like this. If you have a patient with warts all over their face or all over their body diffusely like this, what other condition might they have? Toby's got something for me. Leprosy, not leprosy. Something that would decrease your immune system to, to allow the pox virus to grow. Good. No, no, you're right. Yep. So specifically what I'm referring to is HIV. Patient, patients with HIV that get infected with molluscum contagiosum end up having diffuse eruptions all over their whole body. Okay. Very, um, very sort of uh, discomforting for them having all of these warts all over their body. Okay. So we're looking for HIV. All right. Great. All right. So that is our, our lecture one of microbiology. And I'm going to start on our lecture two, just a minute. Okay. Absolutely. Hmm. Mm hmm You said it correctly. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So for the clue cells, what do we what infection are we talking about with clue cells? It get it gives us a clue. So, 
No, so clue, clue cells are going to be associated. Uh, so coilocytes are HPV. Yes. Uh, yes, so coilocytes are HPV. You are 100% correct. Now, clue cells are associated with... We, uh, I will describe. I'll describe your patient. You describe your patient is having um, uh, some vaginal discharge, and the vaginal discharge is thin. And uh, the vaginal discharge, uh, when we uh, have a look at the infectious agent, we see some gram-variable pleomorphic rods, and the vaginal discharge. Stop me if you figured it out. The vaginal discharge also has a very fishy odor. Gardnerella. Excellent. Good. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you have to add in the clue cell in there somewhere. Like you're looking for a clue in the garden that doesn't smell like a garden or something like that. Okay. So you can remember that clue cells are associated with our Gardnerella. Okay. Very good point. Very good point. What does Toby say? Trichomonas, uh, trichomonas. Uh, trichomonas is different from Gardnerella. So trichomonas is going to be our uh, mobile trophozoite. It's a little protozoa parasite that is going to cause a vaginitis. So that has a lot of inflammation. Um, we're going to see that strawberry service with petechiae. Um, we're going to have a frothy discharge. That's what we see with trichomonas. Uh, with Gardnerella, it's very different. So in here, instead of having a protozoa, we have a bacteria. We have a bacteria that causes a, a thin discharge that is very, very stinky. Um, and uh, it causes a vaginosis rather than vaginitis. So we're not going to see that inflammation. Okay, and we're also going to have that very distinct odor. Now, what's nice about Trichomonas and Gardnerella is we use the exact same antibiotic to treat both of them. We're going to use metronidazole to treat both Trichomonas and Gardnerella. Okay, it covers both of them. Okay. Uh, so in terms of looking on um, under a microscope, for trichomonas, we're looking for a little protozoa with a flagella on the back. It should be swimming around under the microscope when we're looking at it because it's a protozoa. It likes to swim. Versus our Gardnerella, we can gram stain it and it is, is sort of a gram variable. It'll be gram positive here, gram negative there. It's gram variable is how it's described. And then if we look under the microscope, just at the bacteria itself, what we see is the clue cells. Oh, I see. Okay, yes, no. Uh, clue cells are going to be associated with uh, Gardnerella. Okay. All righty. So moving into our micro two, we're going to have a quick review of bacterial genetics. One of the previous classes asked me to add this in here. Um, speaking about our F positive cells, F negative cells, transposition, conjugation, all these good, all this good stuff. Um, so we'll just do a quick review here. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, transposition is just the bacteria's way of rearranging its own DNA. Okay, so that's transposition, its ability to take up DNA and add it into its own genome. Conjugation is where we have a bacteria that is able to create something called a pilus. It's called a sex pilus. Sex pilus. The sex pilus allows for the bacteria to transmit DNA over this uh, highway that it makes between bacterium. So we have the chromosomal DNA. Um, at some point, this chromosomal DNA picks up a plasmid, okay, which is another piece of DNA. And this F plasmid allows the donor cell to create a pilus. Okay? If we had a cell that didn't have this F plasmid, like this recipient cell, you can see the recipient cell has no pilus. It's the F plasmid that gets, gives this uh, bacteria the ability to make a pilus. 
Uh, you know, so we're gonna have that uh, conjugation happen. We're gonna transmit this F plasmid over here. And now look now, oh my goodness. Now we have a pilus on the, on the recipient and a pilus on the original because we transmitted that F plasmid over, okay? So if you ever get a question on what is the purpose of an F plasmid, it is to uh, create a pilus and to enable for conjugation so that bacteria can pass along uh, bits of DNA. Okay, so, uh, you know, if this was, and now this bacteria has the ability to pass over any type of uh, DNA. So if it has some code for a certain kind of toxin, if it has a code for a antibiotic fighting, like a, a, a beta lactamase, right? Um, these types of things can be transmitted bacteria to bacteria. This is how resistance forms, okay? Transformation is where a bacteria will be able to take up free DNA and add it into its, uh, into its own genome, okay? So uh, when a DNA is able to take up, or when a bacteria is able to take up DNA and uh, incorporate it into its genome, that's called a stable transformation, okay? If the bacteria takes up the DNA, doesn't like it, it may degrade it. It's really sort of uh, depends on how the DNA looks. Does it look like it'll fit? Then it'll re recombine it into the own DNA. Okay. Now, the way that I always remember transformation is it has this F in it. F is for free DNA. This is the one that gets asked about the most, I find. Okay. So the ability to uptake free DNA is transformation. All righty. Last is our transduction. Transduction is our way of viruses transmitting DNA into bacteria. So viruses can bind to human cells. They can also bind to bacterial cells. They, are, uh, they will really bind to whatever they can to try and create progeny. And so you can see there's two uh, possible outcomes when a bacteria lands and injects its DNA into a cell. It can inject its DNA into a cell um, chop up the bacterial DNA, that DNA gets mixed with the viral DNA, and now when the viral progeny are created, a bit of bacterial DNA is traveling along with that viral DNA, okay? Now, we, you can see here that this same virus with a bit of bacterial DNA and viral DNA is landing on another bacteria. It injects the bacterial and the viral DNA, and uh, the bacterial DNA now gets uh, taken up or transposed into the bacterial DNA, okay? And so this is our, the way that viruses can contribute to creating um, antibiotic resistance and transmitting uh, different kinds of toxins among different bacteria. You'll see as we talk about different bacteria that there are certain types of um, bacterial toxins that a lot of different types of bacteria have, uh, such as our such as our, um, the exotoxin A in our, um, in the, uh, the pertussis that we talked about in the last lecture has exotoxin A. That same toxin is found in diphtheria. Okay, so this, this is the idea that a toxin that works in the same way, but is found in two very different families of bacteria is partially explained by um, by transduction by uh, viruses, okay? So those are the four types of, um, of DNA transfer you can see and get questions about transposition, which is uh, how bacteria take bits of DNA and add it into their own genome. genome. That's transposition. So as we go from slide five to slide six here, where this little bit of DNA is being added into the uh, bacterial genome, that's transposition. Just this from five to six, that's transposition. This entire process is transduction, but you need transposition to make transduction possible, okay? Conjugation via the sex pilus and transformation uptake of free DNA. Alrighty? Great, so moving on to our bacterial infections. Our bacterial meningitis. Uh, our inflammation of membranes covering the brain and spinal cord uh, should present with the things we're used to seeing, right? Headache, fever, nuchal rigidity. These are the classic signs of meningitis, along with photophobia, 
possibly may have a recent respiratory infection that could have progressed. Uh, Kernig's and Brudzinski's sign. So Kernig's sign is when you have your patient lying flat on their back and then you attempt to bend their neck, uh, what's going to happen is that their knees will flex, right? Because when you bend their neck, you're actually stretching the meninges. So when you stretch the meninges, that's when they're going to have that inflammation and that irritation. And so they're going to bend their knees in response to try and shorten um, their meninges, okay? Uh, Brudzinski's sign is where they're lying flat and then you try and bend their knees and you see sort of the same thing, that they kind of clutch up and um, sort of go into the fetal position, okay? Kernig and Brudzinski's sign, signs of meningitis, okay? So Neisseria meningitidis, very important cause of meningitis. So meningococcal meningitis, uh, still Neisseria, so it's still a diplococcus. Uh, The reservoir is going to be the human respiratory tract. For the risk factors, really look for someone who is entering a a high concentration area, uh, going from a low concentration area. So someone who's going from high school to college someone who's moving into a nursing home, uh, children that are joining a daycare. These are all times where they're going from a place where there's not a lot of people to a place where there's much more people. And um, having that close contact can increase the risk of uh, Neisseria meningitidis. Okay. Uh, Some of the virulence factors here, we have that polysaccharide capsule, LOS proteins, the pili, everything we talked about with, um, you know, Neisseria, um, Neisseria gonococcal infections we can see here. So Thayer Martin, New York agar, uh, ferments glucose and maltose. One thing here is we actually have an inoculation period of three to four days. So your patient will be infected but not really have any idea until four days later. Then we're going to start seeing petechial hemorrhages, rash that can uh, progress to purpura. After that, we can go to involving our meninges. Okay, go to our meningitis. So here that can actually progress to septic shock and DIC as this bacteria gets into our bloodstream. When we did our endocrine lecture, we talked about Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Okay, we said that this particular bacteria loves to go to the adrenal glands. It'll go to the adrenal glands and cause a complete um, circulatory failure due to destruction of those adrenal glands. So we're going to lose all of our aldosterone, we're losing all our cortisol, we're losing our epinephrine, our norepinephrine, all of that is being dis- destroyed. We're going to end up with a hemorrhagic destruction of our adrenal glands. Okay, that's waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. So in terms of treatment, beta-lactams and cephalosporins, a very good treatment. We're going to give prophylaxis of rifampin to any close contacts, okay? That same thing that we did with our, um, you know, our uh, hemophilus influenzae, giving rifampin to close contacts, we'll do here for Neisseria meningitidis. There is a capsular vaccine that most uh, schools will require you to get. Most colleges will require you to have this vaccine before you start school, um, to prevent, um, you know, a breakout of meningitis on their campus. Okay, it's pretty typical. Okay, um, and so that's this some of the different uh, conjugate vaccines for that. Next, our strep, strep pneumo. We said strep pneumo is the number one cause of meningitis in adults and adolescents. Okay, so this is why I said you got to be really familiar with strep pneumo. It's a very common cause of a lot of different stuff. Okay, all of the same stuff we talked about before. Uh, This is going to be a typical meningitis type presentation and really look for that upper respiratory tract infection before it. So we have the sinusitis, we have the middle ear infection, and then that can kind of go to the central nervous system and cause this meningitis infection. Okay, we'll treat this with vancomycin, something a bit of a stronger gun antibiotic to, to prevent further damage. Okay, we talked about the two different types of vaccines. Last, our hemophilus type B. Uh, so we're looking for that PRP capsule again, chocolate agar, same thing as before. Uh, typical presentation. However, uh, if you have any patient who is, say, in a car accident or uh, for some reason has a fracture to their maxilla or anything that can cause CSF leakage, this is one of the bacteria that tend to cause meningitis secondary to that. Okay. So secondary, head trauma with CSF leakage tends to lead to meningitis from hemophilus type B. That's your most likely suspect. Okay, We're going to give prophylaxis of rifampin to close contacts like we talked about before. And there is that conjugate vaccine we can give um, to prevent 
uh, infection with this. Okay, so um, that is uh, it for today. Uh, for our next lecture, um, 